a lot of emails, which is good. First email uh, I just want to throw up is someone said, can you throw up all the formulas that we need to know? So it's not so bad. See, I fit it on a page. So um, there's basically what I like to think of as kind of three categories. There's the geometry, there's physics, and then there's coordinates. So the geometry, the big things are volume and area of a cross section times the thickness. That's what you use when your volume has kind of a weird shape, when the cross sections aren't circles. So you might say, oh, my cross sections are rectangles or my cross sections are triangles. Then you say, all right, let me figure out the area of each cross section multiplied by thickness. You have the washer method when your cross sections look like washers. So it's a big circle minus a little circle. Make sure you figure out what are your radii. You have the shell method. So those are if your little pieces look like tin cans. That's the shell method. You have surface area. And if you memorize it this way, it's very flexible. Integral a to b, 2 pi radius length. And the radius is from the part where you're spinning to where you're spinning around. So every time we talk about radius, it's where is the curve to where you spin around. Now you want to be careful with radius because radius is a measurement, which means that radius should always be positive. So make sure when you get set up your radius, it's a positive value. In general, when you get something out for volume or surface area or for length, if you get a negative answer out, don't just circle it and say, cool, I found the answer and move on. You've made a mistake somewhere. You've been given a gift a chance to go back and correct your mistake. So figure out where your mistake is. For length, there's actually three length formulas. So you should probably know them all. So there's length of a curve y equals f of x, the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. There's the parametric length, square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared dt. And then there's the polar length, f squared plus f prime squared. Um, I'll jump over here to this side. This is coordinates. Obviously, I did not plan well, because you can see it's kind of smooshed in. But for parametric, know what parametric curves are. Um, it's basically the idea is you're plotting x of t, y of t. The two sort of big ideas, other than the fact that we can apply geometry problems and, and physics problems, once you understand how the pieces of these things fit in, really using them with parametric is, is straightforward. There's no big surprises. About the only thing that uh, doesn't fit in is make sure you know how to, to find the slope of a tangent line, and in general, how to find a tangent line. So the slope of a tangent line, that's your derivative, change in y over change in x. So change in y is your y prime, change in x is your x prime. And if you can remember that, that's the hard part to finding the slope of a tangent line, because once you have your slope, points jump out because they're your x and y, and life is good. Polar, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. That's your conversion tool. You also have x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And then, as I know it's a little bit smushed, I'm sorry, area equals, and that's supposed to say a half right there, outer radius squared minus inner radius squared. Make sure, sure you know your trig identities, and in particular power reduction. Now for physics, there's kind of two big ideas. And since we're between friends here, we're all friends here, I will tell you that some of the faculty that write this exam are not fans of this part. Now, I'm not saying it's not on the exam. I'm just saying the people who write the exams are not fans of that part, which is the fluid force problems. So the two big things you should worry about are work and mass slash center of mass. So how do you do work? Well, there's two kinds of work problems, and we're going to talk about some soon. And today, we're not going to really carry anything out. We're going to focus mostly on making sure we know how to set things up. On this exam, if you do not do any integration, so in other words, you just get to the point where you set up an integral and, and stop on every problem that involves integration, and then do the problems that don't involve integration all the way, you can still get about 55 out of 70 points which is a lot of points. I'm willing to bet that the, that's higher than what the average will be. So it's not integration that's going to be your downfall. It's the setting up. 
So we want to make sure we know how to set things up. So for work, there's two kinds of work problems. More or less, they, the, they fall into two categories. There's like, OK, I need to move something up. So that's work equals force times distance. It's like you're pulling on a chain. There's a problem that came a few years ago where you had SpongeBob SquarePants climbing up the Campanile. And it was raining, so of course, he, being a sponge, got heavier as he climbed up. But it's a fun problem. OK. Uh, then there's pumping problems. So pumping problems, well, you sort of say, look, I'm moving something, a distance. And then so you have distance, and then the rest of it is a force. So you have a density and a volume, which comes from area and thickness. And we'll talk about some pumping problems in a few minutes to demonstrate. For mass, someone said, well, can you run through all the different variations? There's really just two. There's one dimensional. There's two dimensional. So the different variations are, if it's one dimensional, it's density times length. Now, where does that apply? Well, it applies if you have a rod, or it even applies if you have a curve, because you can uh, talk about on the curve, I assign a mass to every point. So what happens if it's a curve? Well, if it's a curve, you just pick the right length formula, wherever it is, and that's what goes there. So it's either you know, square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared dt, or maybe it's this term, or maybe it's that term. And then you have your density. For 2D, it's mass is density times height times width. And we'll go through some examples. In fact, I would say that mass is probably the biggest question people had in the emails that were sent. For moment, it's the same formulas for mass with one extra piece. You throw in a distance. And it's a distance to what? Well, it depends moment with respect to what. Because when we talk about moment, a moment is always with respect to a location. So generally, we talk about the origin if we are a one-dimensional thing. But we could talk about with respect to the x-axis or with respect to the y-axis. So generally, this distance is going to be x or y. In theory, you could talk about the moment with respect to anything. So you could talk about the moment with respect to the line x equals 1, but we never do that. We always do things with respect to an axis. And then once you can find your moment, you can talk about your center of mass. You take. Uh, for your x-coordinate, you take the moment with respect to the y-axis divided by your mass. For the y-coordinate, you take the moment with respect to the x-axis divided by your mass. And remember symmetry. If you have symmetry, that cuts your work down. So symmetry means your shape is symmetric, your density is symmetric. And the center of mass always has to lie on any line of symmetry. So that's it. That's your formulas you need to know. Any questions about these before we jump into problems. All right. Good. Well, that's not so bad. We can learn all that. OK. So the most popular question I got. Spring 19, number four. So find the center of mass of a thin plate bounded by the parabola x equals y squared minus y and the line x equals y if the plate has uniform density delta equals 2. And there's a picture. By the way, this exam is loaded with pictures. If we had a problem where we thought the picture will help you understand the problem, the picture's been provided. Some of them are pretty nice pictures, too. I'm, I'm kind of proud of some of the pictures there. So um, anticipate there being pictures. All right, so here's the picture we have. Uh, x equals y squared minus y, x equals y. And we have uniform density. Now, you may not have uniform density. You may have some density which depends on x, or you could have a density which depends on y. Now, one of the things that they like to do is they like to turn you sideways, which means that they like to give you pictures like this where they have x as a function of y instead of what you're used to as y as a function of x. For a lot of people, turning sideways is enough for them not to know what to do. But not for us, because we know how things work. So what can we do? Well, we have two options. One, we can work with trying to integrate with respect to x, because uniform density says we really can work either with respect to x or with respect to y. Or we say, look, 
let's just integrate with respect to y. Because there's nothing in the mass formulas that we talked about that requires us to have something set where we integrate with respect to x. So let's talk about the formulas. Now, for this problem, you need to do three integrals. Mass, moment with respect to x, and moment with respect to y. And the reason you have to do all three, we don't have any symmetry to save us. If we had symmetry, we can usually knock one out. But this one, we get to do all three. Ah, good times, good times. This was back in the days when the exams, I think, were slightly longer. Uh, we cut them down by 15 minutes, so now we probably would use symmetry more often. So let's just work through it. So we're going to integrate with respect to y. And that's just because it's convenient because the curves are de described as functions of y. If our density was a function of y, we'd have to integrate with respect to y. We wouldn't have a choice. All right, so what do we do? Well, so the basic idea is we just think of a little tiny piece. So when, if I'm integrating with respect to y, my little tiny pieces look like thin horizontal rectangles. All right, well, good. So let's talk mass. So the formula for mass, it's integral a to b, and it's density. Uh, let's see what I wrote down. What did I write down? Height, width. Well, I'll say width height, okay. And now we just say, well, what is each piece? Well, first off, you get your bounds. The bounds come from intersection points. If you don't want to know what the intersection points are, you set the curves equal to each other. When does y squared minus y equal y? Well, that's the same as y squared minus 2y equals 0, which is y times y minus 2 equals 0, which says that the intersections happen at y equals 0, and y equals 2. So bounds are 0 to 2. The density, what is it? It's 2. The width, well, that's the length between the two curves. So you always take larger value minus smaller value. So right is the larger value, left is the smaller value, right minus left. So y and subtract y squared minus y. What's the height? That's the little thickness, dy. Then the integral itself is not so bad. Okay, so off we go with that integral. All right, let's do the moments. Well, moment with respect to x. So the only thing that happens with the moment with respect to x is we have this extra distance term. Everything else is the same. So, my apologies, I, I keep writing stuff down. So, the bounds are the same. This last part is the same, so there's still a 2. There's a y minus y squared minus y dy. We just need to figure out the right distance. So, think of it as the middle of the, the rectangle is the center of that mass. And we say, okay, how far is it down to the x-axis? Well, I'm asking the question. You know I have to do it for our last time together for a while. We gotta, okay, all right, all right. Y, all right, good. Gotta leave on a high note. Okay, so the distance is Y. M sub Y, well, again, all these other pieces are the same. So I can just write them down again. And now the question is, what goes here? Well, what's the distance to the y-axis. It would be, normally we call it x. Of course, we have to write everything in terms of y because we're integrating with respect to y. So what do we write it as? Well, so this point is the halfway point between the two curves. If I want to find the halfway point between two curves, what do I need to do? I add the two curves. If I add these two together, what do I get? I get y squared, and then I divide by 2. And now that's my integral. And so these are the setups. So we're not going to do, do the compu whoops, computations. We'll just do the setups here. Now you might say, wait a second, you, you flipped it. Because normally, shouldn't it be the m sub x, which has the, 
has that, like, you know, you add and divide by 2. Well, that's if you're agreeing with respect to x. Just be careful. Think about what you're doing. And always, always, for every problem, on, whenever there's an integral involved, just think about what happens to one little piece. Because if I understand one little piece, I understand it all. OK. So this is another question people asked. You have a, a trough with this strange trapezoidal end, and it's completely filled with molasses. Well, we just needed a really thick fluid. Uh, the, and here's the picture. I won't go through everything. The, the tank has a depth of 3 feet, length of 10 feet. OK, what is it? And uh, we need to completely empty the tank by pumping all of it through a tube extending 2 feet above the top of the tank. So there's lots of questions people have about these kinds of problems. And um, almost all of them are, how do you set it up? Because once you set something up, the rest is usually just polynomials. It's, it, integration is not so bad. So how do pumping problems work? Well, you should remember your basic setup. A to B, you have a distance. That's how far you have to move the fluid. Then you have a density, how much the fluid weighs per cubic foot. Then you have to have an area, which is the area of a cross section, and the thickness of a cross section. So those are the pieces. Now, some of these are pretty quick. Now, the way you should think about doing this is you just to say, I have a little tiny slice where you're, you're going to pump this piece up. Okay, so that's, that's our little tiny slice, and we're going to pump it up. Oh my gosh, I feel like I, I was, if this had been 20 years ago, I would have been, we're going to pump it up. <laughs> but, you know, that's uh, Saturday Night Live characters, which haven't been on TV for like 20 years, so, all right, I'm old. Okay, so, you always think about there's a slice. And we're moving the slice up. And we're going to move it up one slice at a time. Now, one of the first things you have to decide is if the problem hasn't given it to you, you have to decide on your coordinates. So there's oftentimes a question, well, how do I figure out distance? Is it y? Is it some number minus y? Is it some number plus y? And the answer is yes, depending upon how you choose your coordinates. Now, how do you choose your coordinates? And the answer is, choose them so they're kind of natural. And if you don't have a natural choice, just pick something. There are many possible correct answers depending upon where you choose your coordinates. So where do you want your coordinates? Do you want it at the very bottom? Do you want, do you want y equals 0 here? Do you want y equals 0 there? Do you want y equals 0 there? The bottom, which is perfectly fine. OK, so y equals 0. And then you should also talk about an orientation. So which way is up for y? Once you pick your coordinate system, everything else is now locked in place. So you should label certain things. So for example, where the, where the fluid is between here, the fluid starts at 0, goes up to 3. And you should also label where it's pumping to. In this case, it's pumping 2 feet above the top, so it's pumping to 5. So you should know those numbers. So when we have this slice here, we're thinking that this slice is at some value y. So the question is, how far is it from an arbitrary y up to y equals 5? 5 minus y. So that's what the distance will be. In, in general, again, this depends. If you had put y equals 0 at the top and then oriented downward, then the distance would be y. So it's not like, oh, it's going to be 5 minus y, or it's going to be y. It could be either. It just depends on your coordinate system. What were our bounds going to be? 0 to 3. Density is going to be given. Uh, we did once have an exam a long, long time ago, back, back in the old days where density varied, but almost always it's a constant. The thickness, that's, that's just sort of this small change here on the side, up and down. That's your dy. So almost always, the hardest part about this is after you've chosen your coordinate system and you've paid attention, is how do you handle area? 
And the way you handle area, would, it varies a little bit. It varies from problem to problem. But you just sort of think about what's the shape. So looking at this picture, what's the shape? It's rectangle. So you're like, oh, rectangle. So you have two sides. And one side is going to be super easy. This side, it's going to be 10. It's always 10. So it's 10 times something. Now this side varies. Now you have to be careful. So you want to think about, OK, how does it vary? Well, uh, we know at y equals 0, it should be 2 feet here. And at y equals 3, it should be 3 feet. And if we look at the picture, it should grow at a constant rate, because these are nice straight lines. So it's going to grow at a nice constant rate. So you can even just sort of do a quick sketch. So here uh, I'll have y. Here I'll have my width. So I could say at 0, it's 2 feet. And at 3, it's 3 feet. Well, what's, uh, it's a line. What's the intercept? 2. two. So the width is 2 plus, and now what's the slope? And I go up by 1 when I go over by 3. So 1 third. 2 plus 1 third y. That is what goes here. Now, you should check your work. And the way you check your work is you just say, let me try some special cases. So for instance, Let's try the bottom. The bottom of the trough corresponds to y equals 0. Am I getting the right numbers? Is my area 20 when y equals 0? Yeah. Try the top, y equals 3. Is my area 30? Yeah, because you get 2 plus 1. And so if you're not sure about it, just check a couple of values and see if that works out. OK, so then from here, it's just computation. Now, since pumping problems are so nice, there's also another pumping problem. So here you have a fluid. It looks like maybe Pepto-Bismol color. And uh, all right. And we want to pump it out. So it's only the bottom part. You know, we may not always have it completely full. That's fine. Uh, you don't always have to completely empty it. So we're going to pump, pump this out. So let's pick coordinates. Where do you want the coordinates to be? Well, of course, where do you want zero? Bottom, top, bottom. That's fine. And, and you can always pick coordinates for whatever you want. Just pick the ones that are most convenient. So y equals zero, and I'm going to orient up. So the water level here is six. Here is 10. And I need to pump to the top of, of the tank. So the tank atop is at 10. So we have the same formula. And so we can actually start sort of reading off what the pieces are. So for us, uh, let's go through this. We can do this really quick. Integral from A to B, what are A and B? 0 to 6, because you go A and B are where the fluid is. Not where the tank is, where the fluid is. OK, now we think about we have a small slice here. So here's our small slice at Y. How far do we have to go to get to where we pump out? 10 minus Y. Because we need to get it to 10, and this is at Y. So 10 minus Y. And if you're not sure about that formula, again, check, OK? How far do I have to go from the bottom? How far do I have to go from the top? And just make sure it, it works. Uh, density will be given in our problem. Just look for that pounds per cubic foot number. So that's 50. The thickness is your dy, which means the area. Again, area is the hard part. So look at your cross section. What do you see? Circle. Circle. Now, someone said triangle. They're getting ahead. Because we're going to do a different kind of cross section in a second. If I want the area of a circle, area of a circle is pi radius squared. So I just need to figure out what the radius is. 
Now, how do I figure that out? There's a couple of ways, but what I like to do is I like to do a slice. Now, when you have a cone, you do a slice. Lo and behold, what you see is a triangle. So here I have y equals 0. Here I have, now you could do your slice at y equals 10. And I, or you could do it at y equals 6. The reason I choose y equals 10 is that I have this measurement here. So this is 6 across. And then here, I have some small depth. Now, I just need to label things. I can, for instance, I can cut this in half. Half of the top would be 3. This length would be our radius that we're after. We don't know what it is yet. This height, what would that be? What? Y, good. Ah, oh, man, I'm, I'm being too nice. Well, because that's what we need to know. That's why. Okay, and that height is 10. Where am I going with labeling all this? Similar triangles, looking at ratios. Ratios of similar triangles are the same. So if you see things like cones, similar triangles. So what does the similar triangle say? It says, take the big triangle. I'm just going to do the... I'm just going to do half of it. It says that 3, which is the length on the top, to 10, which is the height, so that's the ratio. It's the same as the same ratio in the small triangle, r, to y. Now, you rearrange this, you get y equals 10 over 3 times r. But we don't, we don't want that. Instead, we want to solve for r. Good. That's why you have crossing out technology. Why? Because we need the radius. So that goes there. 3 over 10 y quantity squared. And life is good. And you're ready to go. Now, again, you should sort of say, check to see if that makes sense. How much should you have at the very bottom? Zero. If the tank were completely full, what should be the area on the top? It should be 9 pi, because it's, you see at the very top, it's a circle with radius 3. Does it turn out to be 9 pi at the top? At y equals 10, you get 9 pi. So again, check yourself. Check yourself before you might wreck yourself, as the saying goes. All right. Um, so questions about polar coordinates and area. Now, so there were a couple, of, two specific questions. And looking at this, you might have a third specific question saying, can we get that? Um, if we think you need it, we will give it to you. If we don't think you'll need it, we won't give it to you. So, we, we do think about it. We do think about it. Now, the, the questions were, how do you use symmetry? And the answer is, trust the pictures. We're not going to mislead you with the pictures. Because the pictures have been generated not by human hands, but by a computer going through and plotting thousands of points. So on this problem, which uh, I like to think of as the turtle problem, because it kind of looks like a turtle in a shell. So uh, anyways, on this one, what do you see? Well, you see five little pieces. So, should we compute each one? No, that would be silly. We compute one of them and multiply by five. Okay, so look at the picture and use symmetry. Now, not everything will have symmetry. This problem does not have symmetry, and it's okay if it doesn't have symmetry. The other question, of course, was besides symmetry, was what do you set equal? And the rule is, if you have two curves, you look at where do they intersect. So this says there's two curves, 3 and 3 plus 2 sine 5 theta. So this is where you would set those two equal. 3 equals 3 plus 2 sine of 5 theta. 
And here you see that, lo and behold, the threes cancel. You can divide by two. It's the same as saying sine of phi theta equals zero. Now from here you say, okay, well, when does sine of phi theta equals zero? Don't worry about the phi theta. Just say, when does sine equals zero? When's the first time sine equals zero? Zero. When's the next time it equals zero? Pi. So zero and pi. So that's the input to sine. So your input is five theta. Five theta equals zero or pi. So that says theta is zero or pi fifths. And now you have your angles. So there's zero. And there's your pi fifths. And there are your bounds. And you're ready to go. Your outer radius, trust the picture. And in this case, it's the three plus two sine five theta. The inner radius is three. Now here, it's slightly more interesting. Again, you have the two curves. You set the two curves equal to each other. So square root of two sine theta, cosine theta equals cosine theta. All right, well, when do these intersect? Well, what do you want to do? Yeah, you, you kind of want to divide out the cosine theta and then say, okay, then I'm left with something easy. Should you divide by cosine theta? You're probably saying, I'm guessing not because you're not doing that. You, you should technically be a little bit careful because if you divide out by something, what's the possibility that you have done? Divide by zero. And you don't want to divide by zero. That's a terrible thing. So it's better to factor out. So in this case, either cosine theta equals zero well, we come along here and say, oh, pi over 2. So that's this angle here, pi over 2. Or, of course, this part equals 0. But it's easy to see that's the same as saying sine of theta equals a half. And you come along and say, ah, pi over 6. And you should be able to eyeball and say, yeah, that kind of feels pi over 6-ish. The picture, you know, you should, you should expect that the angles we're going to give you are going to be angles which are reasonable to work with. All right, now in these two cases, whenever you set these integrals up, you always think about, you come out from the origin, because it's always out from the origin when you do polar. So we always have here, it's an outside curve minus an inside curve. If we do it here, we have a, again, outside curve minus an inside curve. That might not be the case. It might be the case that you might have something which looks, uh, we once had a problem that had that shape. It was kind of a, a strange function. In this case, what's the inside curve? Zero. Zero. Yeah, we go all the way in. OK. And we've also had, there was a, a problem we had on last week where we were like, well, what's this area? Well, what's the outside curve? What's the inside curve? Do you remember how we did this one? Well, the answer is we split into parts. We said, look, one part, the outside curve, is this. And then in the other part, I can find a slightly different shade of red, the outside curve is the other one. So. Be prepared. We might do that. So just be flexible. Be flexible. All right. So we won't go through and do the whole thing here. But ball 18 number one, there was a question. Why did you do, the way the email was phrased, why did you do the washer with respect to x in part b, but when you did it with respect to x, it was a shell. And uh, the answer is that this one is really testing you on can you set up your integrals. So the thing is you want to think about how you set your integrals up. So one of them, you want to do it around the x-axis. The other one, you want to do it around the line x equals minus 2. So those are our two axes that we're spinning around. So you have to think about what method you're using. Now for us, we say, uh, let's suppose we were going to do integration with respect to x. 
If we were integrating with respect to x, that says our slices tend to look like this. Small change in x, so it's a tall, skinny piece. If we spin this around the x-axis, what shape are we forming? When we spin it, what do we spin it? It's a disc, which is just a sort of a, a special case of a washer. Now, of course, if we come over here and we spin, what shape are we making? Yeah, that's definitely a washer. It's a holy disc. All right? So if we integrate with respect to x, we would use the washer method. Now, how many integrals would we need if we integrate this with respect to x? Two. Now, for anybody who was saying, what? Why two? Because at whatever this point happens to be, there's a change in the bounding curves. Whenever you change a bounding curve, you have to split your integral. So that says you'd have to do two integrals. Now, that's if we'd used the washer method and we integrated with respect to x around here. Let's do the other problem where we, we still integrate with respect to x, but we're spinning around the line x equals minus 2. Same slice, but now when you spin that slice, what do you form? It's a shell. So, depending upon which axis you spin around or what kind of line you spin around, you could spin and form a washer or you could spin and form a shell. So if you're not sure what to do, just say, take a small slice, spin it around, and that will tell me. So that's why, depending upon which variable we integrate with respect to and where we spin it around, we might switch between doing a washer and doing a shell. All right, let's see. How are we doing on time? We got time. Okay. Set up but do not evaluate an integral that finds the volume when the region in the second quadrant bounded by r equals theta, so this is r equals theta, for half pi less than theta less than pi is spun around the x-axis. So we want to spin this around the x-axis. Now, hmm, how do we spin? Well, let's just take a slice here. And if we spin, we form a disk. So this doesn't seem so bad. So according to the disk method, what's our volume? Well, add up pi times your radius squared and then your thickness. Now, so far, that seems pretty straightforward. What's our catch here? Well, kind of our catch is, this is not y as a function of x. We're so used to doing these when we have y's as functions of x. So we got to think about what's going on. So we're going to have not this, this theta is not what's down here. Theta is an angle. So we're still going to write everything in terms of theta. So pi halves to pi. This pi will become what? Yeah, still pi. Yeah, cool, cool. Now, our radius. That is how far are we? You know, what's the distance? So radius is always a distance down to where you're spinning. So what is our radius right now? Well, we could think of it as y. Yes, good. Now, the thing is, we need to express that in terms of theta. So let's work our way up to theta. What do we write y as? R sine theta. Again, we're closer, but we still have an r. So what does that become? Theta sine theta. So this would become theta sine theta squared. We're, we're still not done because we have a thickness. That is how much did we change in x? So this, is, this would be like our you know, dx, because it's a small bit of x. So let's talk about x. What would x be? Theta would be, x would be theta cosine theta. So what would dx be? 
yeah, we can, we can talk about, you know, x prime, which would be uh, negative theta sine theta plus cosine theta. Okay, so that's, that's our change in x, sine to a small change in theta, right, d theta. That's how much x changes by. Is that what goes there, and why not? The problem is it's going the wrong direction. As your theta, because as you have theta move, it's spinning it out that way. So what's happening is that your thickness is not just your change in x, because your change in x currently, is, it's decreasing as you change x. You, the thickness should be a positive value. So what do we need to do to correct it? Yeah, multiply by a negative. So it's really theta sine theta minus cosine theta d theta. And now that's the setup, and we're done. So the question somebody had is like, okay, how do we handle going backwards? And the answer is just look and see which way the curve is traveling and introduce the minus sign. And it looks like people are packing up, so I guess we'll stop.